Commit the committee will now proceed to consideration of the bill HR 736 for amendment. The bill was circulated in advance and printed copies are available. The clerk shall designate the bill. HR 736, a bill to require elementary and middle schools that receive federal funds to obtain parental consent before changing a minor child's gender markers, pronouns, or preferred name on any school form, or allowing a child to change the child's sex-based accommodations, including locker rooms or bathrooms. Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point, and any amendment offered shall be considered as read. Does anyone seek to be recognized? Mr. Wahlberg, for what purpose do you seek recognition? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk titled uh, H736ANS under slash 02. The clerk shall designate the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 736 offered by Mr. Wahlberg of Michigan. Identifier H736ANS underscore 02. Without objection, the amendment shall be considered original text for purposes of further amendment. The amendment in the nature of a substitute has already been distributed. I now recognize Congressman Wahlberg for five minutes to explain the amendment in the nature of a substitute. I thank the chair for including H.R. 736, the parental rights over the education and care act of their kids or protects, Protect Kids Act in today's markup. Across the country, we're seeing a rise in policies aimed at keeping parents in the dark about what's happening at their children's school. The latest and most noteworthy example of this is California's AB 1955, which prohibits schools from having policies that require parental notification about their child's behavior while in school. However, this is nothing new. More than 1,000 school districts across our country have enacted policies that withhold information from parents about their own children. Parents Defending Freedom or Defending Education reports that over 20,000 schools have these policies, impacting roughly 12 million children, or approximately one out of every five students. This is simply unacceptable. Teachers at Eau Claire Area School District were told during a professional development session, and I quote, remember, parents are not entitled to know their kids' identities. That knowledge must be earned. For heaven's sake, don't birth pains and stretch marks and paying school taxes earn that right? What about housing, clothing, feeding, loving, Aren't, that, aren't those things enough as well? This is just one example in a litany of tragic but damaging policies that seek to cut parents out of the important decisions and conversations with their own children. These policies are out of step with a vast majority of Americans, and importantly, the parents of these children who simply want the best for their children. The Protect Kids Act, which I introduced with Senator Tim Scott, would require that federally funded public elementary and middle schools obtain consent from the parents before changing a student's gender markers on a school form, pronouns, or sex-based accommodations, including bathroom or locker room assignments. Why would schools require parental consent for their child to go on a field trip or acknowledgement of a failing grade on a test, but something as significant as sex-based accommodations or going by a different identity is deemed too much to share with parents and therefore must be hidden from them? This is unacceptable and runs counter to the constitutionally affirmed right that parents have over the education and upbringing of their children, let alone the God-given authority, responsibility, and accountability placed in the parent's hands at the birth of their child, their child. They have the right to know when their child is attempting to make major life changes. And so I urge my colleagues to support this common sense bill and I yield back my time. Are there any members who wish to be recognized for further discussion on the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Takano, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. 
Uh, I move to strike last word and rise in strong opposition to this bill. You're recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair, when I came to uh, Congress, uh, I came to Congress because I wanted to make sure schools were properly funded, well staffed, and that every child had access to a quality education. Instead, I find myself sitting in yet another markup of a bill that furthers none of these aims, but spends our valuable committee time, resources, and taxpayer money to play political football with the lives of kids and families. It's a waste, uh, but what's worse is the destructive impact on real people's lives. What H.R. 736, the purported Protect Kids Act, does is insert politicians into the parent-child relationship and put school staff in control of how and when families have deeply personal conversations. This, the text, which is riddled with false assertions and bad faith arguments in the findings of the introduced version, requires parental consent to be obtained before changing a child's gender markers, pronouns, or preferred name on any school form or allowing a child to sex to change sex-based accommodation. This, it does not amend the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which already requires parents be permitted to inspect and review their child's educational records maintained by the school, but instead accuses school, schools of a concerted effort to hide information from parents. Now, as an educator, I know the importance uh, of parental involvement, as a former educator, I should say. But I also know firsthand that not every child lives in a safe, supportive home. Years ago, when I was a public high school teacher, one of my students was outed to his parents by school employees. He was viciously beaten by his father, then transferred to another school. It's fair to say that all school personnel involved regretted how it was handled. His story, tragically, is not an uncommon one. A staggering 40% of all homeless youth are LGBTQ, largely due to familial rejection. Nearly seven in 10 LGBTQ youth report anxiety, and over half experience symptoms of depression, and 40% have already seriously considered suicide in the past year. Good teachers care about their kids, and good teachers know that a relationship with parents is important. But when home is not safe for LGBTQ kids, school becomes their safe place. And teachers should be their cheerleaders, not their first bullies. This bill frames school personnel as involved in a concerted conspiracy to, quote, deliberately hide information, end quote. Quote, encourage children to keep secrets, end quote. And, quote, sabotage the parent-child relationship, end quote. I resent that characterization of our educators, and I reject it. I can tell you from my own experience as an educator, the requirements that this bill imposes will put educational professionals in an impossible bind. As a teacher in California, I had a duty to report suspicion that a child may be in danger at home, a duty which teachers in many other states also share. If I were required to report a child's identity to a family that I knew would not be supportive, I would be subjecting that student to a home situation that I knew would harm them. No matter the eventual result, I can be sure that the trust the student had in me would be broken. This bill forces good teachers to be in a situation where they do bad things. It alienates students from their parents, it outs children, it forces kids back in the closet, it is a fundamental invasion of privacy that puts young people in danger. Now, transgender, transgender children are already overrepresented in the foster care system, <coughs> juvenile detention centers, and homeless shelters. Our focus should be on giving parents and teachers the tools to ensure that children don't fall through the cracks, not close off their options. Now, I will always vigorously defend the rights of parents to raise their children and to be actively involved in their education and I will defend the rights of children to learn and grow in a healthy, safe environment. H.R. 736 needlessly puts the safety and well-being of transgender youth at risk, imposes government interference in a relationship between parents and children, and demonizes educators. So I oppose this bill, 
And I urge my colleagues to do the same, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ticano. Ms. Miller, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox and Congressman Wahlberg for your leadership on this important legislation that upholds parental rights. Per protecting parental rights is not a waste. It is a number one priority. And I'm proud to be co-sponsor of Parental Rights Over the Education and Care of Their Kids Act. Parents are the only ones who should be making decisions that shape their child's development and well-being. This bill mandates that elementary and middle schools secure parental consent before making any changes to a child's gender or preferred name, as well as before changing which locker rooms or bathrooms they are permitted to use. Under the Biden-Harris administration, safeguarding gender-specific spaces has become more critical than ever. Time and time again, we have seen Joe Biden and Kamala Harris attempt to force our girls to use the same bathrooms as biological men with no say from parents. The American people are fed up with these policies, and it's long past time for us to stand up in defense of American parents. This legislation does exactly that by forcing schools to involve parents in decisions that have profound and lasting impacts on their children. I urge my colleagues to vote in support of this bill, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Miller. Uh, Dr. Adams, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to strike the last word. You're recognized. Uh, I rise in, in opposition to this bill. Uh, this bill is another effort by the majority to further harm and marginalize transgender students in our schools. These students are there to, to get an education in a safe and welcoming environment, something I believe we all want for all of our children. Legislation like this would further alienate students from their teachers and classmates and affect their mental health, which then impacts their ability to focus and learn. This bill is, is one of countless others that the majority has put forward this Congress attempting to reduce the rights and dignity of our transgender students. The majority has decided this takes priority over reducing student debt, school violence, and student hunger and homelessness. The majority is once again hiding from its responsibilities to the American public by focusing on another one of its culture wars. And so in the wake of school shooting just last week, this is an insult. We need to refocus our agenda on taking care of our students and setting them up for success. And that includes upholding an environment of respect and dignity in the classroom for all students. As an educator of 40 years, I know the future of America resides in the classroom. And so we must take that reality more seriously and focus on the big issues impacting our students. This bill would do harm to many of our students, so I stand in opposition uh, against this bill. I yield back the balance of my time, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Mr. Good, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I move to strike the last word. You're recognized. The bill before us simply requires that elementary and middle schools who willingly take federal dollars must obtain parental consent before changing a child's gender, pronouns, or name on any school form. Sadly, Parents Defending Education has collected data showing there are over 20,000 schools across the country that have policies that prevent or prohibit faculty and staff from disclosing a student's so-called gender identity to his or her parents without the student's permission. So these schools permit the child to self-diagnose and then support them in deceiving their parents in a most life-altering decision. In my own district, Albemarle County Public Schools, outside Charlottesville, says, quote, gender expansive youth often experience significant family challenges. Prior to contacting a student's parents or guardian, the principal or designee should speak with the student. 
If the student does not want the school to contact the student's parents, the school shall honor that request. This is heartbreaking and has terrible consequences for our nation's children. It's also the epitome of the progressive nanny state that says that the government can manage your family better than you can. This is what they do in police states around the world. Schools with these policies are driving a wedge intentionally between parent and child. Worse yet, they're doing irreparable harm to the child. The left's gender ideology feeds on confusion and exploits the vulnerability of children. Adults must stand firm on the truth that there are only two sexes and two genders. We should not perpetuate the lie that there are any other genders by keeping secrets from parents. Is there anything worse you could do to a parent? And to treat a child at school as a different gender without telling the parent. I disagree so much with what with the federal government's general involvement in education. Uh, but the federal government does have a fundamental job to protect the God-given rights like those of a parent towards the care of his or her, her own child. So I support this legislation. I urge all my colleagues to do the same. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Good. Ms. Bonamici, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move to strike the last word and speak in opposition to the amendment in the nature of the substitute and the underlying bill. You're recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This bill is yet another attempt to micromanage educators, continue the ongoing attack against LGBTQI plus students, and legislate parent-child relationships. Schools should be a place where children and teens feel safe to live and learn as their authentic selves. Sometimes school may be the only place where students feel safe at all. And although many transgender and non-binary students have supportive parents, unfortunately, this is not always the case. Students may fear negative repercussions or even outright abuse at home if their preferred gender identity or chosen name becomes known to unsupportive family members. And as Mr. Takano made clear, a large percentage of homeless youth are LGBTQ because they are afraid to go home or kicked out of their homes. Forcing schools to out students to their families is not only unnecessary, it very well could be dangerous for the students and their mental health and well-being. Additionally, it's unclear what counts as a school form under this legislation. Does it include attendance sheets or seating charts? Are, students, are teachers required to address their students only by their full legal name and the pronouns they were assigned at birth? Can a teacher label a student desk or put a name tag on the classroom door without fearing that their school's federal funding may be revoked? That's not clear. Requiring schools to get parental consent before using students' preferred names and pronouns, frankly, is ridiculous. Any child who uses a nickname of any kind would be affected by this legislation. For example, if my colleague who introduced this bill, Mr. Wahlberg, went to an elementary or middle school, if he were a student there, he'd be forced to submit a request for his teachers to call him Tim instead of his legal name, Timothy. Now, this is a needless requirement that would further burden educators and school staff. Now, finally, I want to publicly call on the committee majority. If we truly care about kids, let's take action on an issue that really matters to school safety in our schools, gun violence. There have been 27 school shootings on K-12 campuses in 2024 alone, with six school shootings since the beginning of the 2024-25 school year, including the recent massacre at Appalachie High School in Georgia. Families are sending their children to school, not knowing if they will see them again at the end of the day, and we're spending our time discussing names and pronouns in bathrooms. Instead of performing these pointless political stunts, we should be considering bills with the potential that will save lives and keep students safe. It won't matter what the children call themselves if their lives are cut short by senseless acts of violence committed by individuals who should not have access to firearms, especially weapons of war. So for these many reasons, I urge my colleagues to oppose this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici. Mr. Kiley, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. A few weeks ago, uh, the governor of California signed a, a truly shocking law, unlike anything that exists uh, anywhere in the country, uh, which requires schools to keep secrets uh, from parents when it comes to issues of profound importance to their child's 
uh, development. In fact, it's worse than that. It actually requires schools to lie to parents. It could require them to create a whole dummy file where uh, the child is referred one way uh, in uh, you know, communications within the school and is referred to another way uh, in communications with parents. And you know, just think about how perverse this is. Uh, several of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have noted uh, that students who are uh, questioning their gender identity uh, are at a higher risk of suicidal uh, ideations. And so here you have a bill that orders schools to keep parents in the dark when their child is at a higher risk of suicide. It's hard to overstate just how perverse that is. And so uh, this bill, the Protect Kids Act, uh, is very simple. It says that we ought to just keep parents in the loop when it comes to these things. I think it's common sense, but you know, I will say, I think we should ask, why is it that this law in California uh, exists? What's, what's motivating it? And uh, in my view, I think it is an intentional provocation. Uh, it is an attempt to turn our schools into a culture war uh, battlefield in order to shield them from scrutiny when it comes to the things that actually matter, when it comes to whether students are actually learning. In California, we have among the worst education outcomes in the country. We have absolutely disgraceful achievement gaps in our schools. We have the lowest literacy rate in the entire country. We have the longest COVID school shutdowns in the entire country. And frankly, the governor of California and the supermajority legislature would rather not talk about those things, let alone do anything about it. They'd much rather provoke culture war battles around issues like this. So I'm glad that this legislation uh, is being proposed. I think its passage will restore some common sense and hopefully allow us to refocus uh, the purpose of our schools on teaching kids to read, teaching them to write, and preparing them for success in life. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Kiley. Mr. Scott, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I oppose H.R. 736, so-called Protect the Kids Act. This is just another chapter in the majority's culture war campaign. The bill would require schools to seek and acquire parental consent for allowing a child to be called a different name other than their birth name without any exception for obvious safety of the child. Let me be clear. I believe parental engagement is central to student success. Parental engagement in schools is closely linked to better student uh, behavior, higher academic achievement, and enhanced social skills. Unfortunately, this bill not, does nothing to increase or support parental engagement, nor does it do anything to protect students. It simply creates more paperwork and bureaucracy while fostering a culture of fear and distrust between parents and schools and between students and teachers. It's also inappropriate to insert schools into the middle of a conversation occurring between many parents and their children. This bill is another obvious example by this majority of promoting bigotry and fear-mongering instead of prioritizing issues that would actually help families, students, and schools. Instead of addressing learning loss and closing achievement gaps by dedicating funds for evidence-based interventions that respond to students' academic and social needs, such as after school, extended day, and summer learning programs, the majority is choosing to promote the bullying of mar marginalized youth. Instead of addressing gun violence, here we are addressing uh, this culture war. Instead of addressing the chronic neglect that has forced students and educators across the country to learn and work in outdated and hazardous school buildings across the country, the majority is promoting overbroad legislation that would burden all students teachers, parents, and students, instead of working to support students' mental health needs by dedicating funding to additional school counselors and mental health professionals. Majority is choosing to further marginalize vulnerable transgender students, risk, increasing the risk of adverse mental health outcomes. So here we are focusing on the, whether the kids should be allowed to be called by a name other than the one on their birth certificate, something that children have been doing since time immemorial. As I said earlier, if federal law required every single teacher I had in school to write to my parents to get permission to call me Bobby instead of Robert, that would have been ridiculous and it would have been a waste of their time and my parents' time 
and we're wasting our time today. For these reasons, I urge my colleagues to vote no on the amendment nature of a substitute and no on the bill, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Scott. There being no further discussion on the amendment in the nature of a substitute, the committee will move to consideration of amendments. Are there any members who would like to offer amendments? There being no amendment, the question now occurs on the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 736. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. In the, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment in the nature of a substitute is agreed to.